So some of you may recognize the, the title of my talk, Morals Without Religion. It's the title of Margaret Knight's amazing 1955 radio essays. And I'm going to be looking at the context of those essays. I'm going to be looking at what has changed from, from, from then to now, but also a, a bit of a personal journey as well. And um, why I feel as though I have quite a bit in common uh, with Margaret Knight. So the subtitle of my talk is The Unholy Mrs. Knight and the Hypocritical Humanist. So I was brought up an Anglican. My family went to church pretty much every Sunday at a huge church in central Bristol, St. Mary Redcliffe, and this is it. I went to Sunday school when I was little and then I attended services as I got older. It was quite high church. They just about stopped short of swinging censers, but there was plenty of ritual and mystery. I loved it. I loved the smell of the candles, the lowest notes of the organ that shook the floor in the church and vibrated behind your sternum the embroidered chaucibles and the altar cloths, soaring architecture, it's a magnificent building, amazing, amazing roof bosses, every one of them different. And I reckon I could still chant the Nicene Creed. I was trying this this morning in the bathroom, it, I can, it's quite shocking, it's burned into my mind. Age 14, I was confirmed. And then, and then I started to think about whether I actually believed in any of the tenets of the faith that I'd been steeped in from birth. I was a scientist at heart, I was questioning everything, and some of the claims that this religion made seemed fairly flaky. Uh, not transubstantiated or consubstantiated, but unsubstantiated. I talked about my doubts with my dad. As an engineer, he approached the Bible, Old and New Testaments, as a compilation of myths with some truth buried deep in it and some useful moral teachings. But for me, there was just something quite fundamental that seemed to be incompatible with the lightest possible way of being a Christian. When I examined my beliefs properly, I couldn't accept that Jesus was the son of a God in anything more than an entirely metaphorical sense. And there was something more than that. I just didn't believe in God. And so age 15, I stopped going to church. My dad accepted it. My mum told me I was rejecting all the values I'd been brought up with. When I left for university a few years later, I turned vegetarian. Once again, she told me I was rejecting all the values I'd been brought up with. And not to bother coming home, as she certainly wouldn't be cooking me any vegetarian meals if I did. Having rejected the religion and the meat eating that I'd been brought up with, I went off to medical school, and off into a strange, somewhat convoluted career where I graduated as a, uh, as a doctor and worked as a doctor. And then I became a university lecturer specializing in anatomy and biological anthropology before adopting another role alongside the academic one, that of public engagement, uh, television, uh, and, and writing books as well. It was a joy I discovered through, through doing television. And then of course, um, I found my feet as, uh, having found my feet as a writer, I reached the absolute pinnacle, the apotheosis of any career as Pothuk, president of Humanist UK. <laughs> now, I must admit, I thought this would be controversial. I have a strong Protestant work ethic. I perhaps look like I ought to be firmly part of the establishment, along with the established church, of course. I'm the daughter of a church warden, for God's sake. What I didn't expect was the controversy that, I, uh, that erupted last November after I was interviewed by the Sunday Times as the incoming president of Humanist UK. We had a very wide-ranging interview about humanist weddings, pastoral care, civil rights, but actually when it went to print, it boiled down to just one issue. Now, I've supported Humanist UK's Faith Schools campaign for many years, They've done an absolutely brilliant job of monitoring the emergence of illegal faith schools, campaigning for evolution to be taught. It's now in the uh, curriculum in primary school. They've campaigned for inclusive sex and relationships education. Um, and also, of course, questioned why so many, a third of taxpayer funded state schools are affiliated with a particular faith, mostly C of E. And this for the Sunday Times was the most controversial part of the campaign. Now, I was completely upfront about sending my own children to C of E school. Indeed, that was part of my argument. My husband and I had found ourselves in the situation that 
thousands and thousands of non-religious parents find themselves every year if I wanted my children to go to a reasonably local state primary school, it would have to be a C of E school. And in these schools, the diocese has fairly extensive influence over the curriculum. And some even practice selective admissions. They openly discriminate against the children of non-religious parents. And I think for people who, haven't, who aren't thinking about sending their children to primary school, um, it's, it, it comes as a real surprise to a lot of people that there is this discrimination in the, in the system. Well, following um, this headline, the, the article itself was, was fairly reflective of, of, uh, of my feelings and my views and, and, and was well reported. But the headline attracted a lot of knee-jerk reactions, especially on social media, of course. So cue a Twitter pile on where I was accused of hypocrisy. Um, and I was, I was there kind of shouting into the storm. I'm not a hypocrite. This is the point I'm making. Non-religious parents don't have a real choice. Kids of non-religious parents are being discriminated against because of their parents' lack of faith. I shouted into the storm. But the interview provoked an interesting conversation at least. And lots of parents at the time contacted me to say, that they were in the same position, that they were facing these difficulties as well. And lots of people, I'm pleased to say, also joined Humanist UK around this time as well. It was the following Sunday that for me, all hell broke loose. Having waited 30 years to properly express her outrage at my apostasy, my mother wrote to the Sunday Times. <laughs> and followed up with an interview. Now, I'm not going to delve into that in any detail. It's all there if you want to look it up online. But it was, as the editor said when he rang me on the Saturday evening before it went to press, not a supportive letter. So a family row, apparently, I'm not sure you can call it a row because I had no idea, um, involving a BBC presenter, the right-wing press lapped it up and bade for more, and social media went absolutely mad for it. An article in the Mail on Sunday um, by Peter Hitchens uh, was headlined, if our, if our church and our schools are so wicked, Alice, why do you send your children to one? I'd kind of explained that, I don't have much choice. <laughs> While others were suggesting that I was not only a hypocrite, um, but possibly a liar as well, uh, as Julie Lynn wrote in Conservative Woman. How wretchedly uncomfortable it is for the rich and famous, I'm not sure about the first one, not sure about the second one, anyway, with ideological credentials to protect when they have to find a school for their offspring. BBC presenter Alice Roberts is just the latest to have been rumbled as having her two children at a school of whose very existence she does not approve. And she went on, as an intelligent individual as well as a committed humanist, did Roberts really not have what it took to make sure that she secured that place at one of the non-faith schools she would have preferred, allegedly. That is to say, a house move in the years she had to think about it. And then she also suggests I should have gone privately. Maybe Professor Roberts just hoped she could get away with it. In fact, I wasn't hoping to get away with anything. I'd used my personal story to illustrate the situation that thousands of non-religious parents find themselves in every year. And the information hadn't been uncovered in an awkward way by the Sunday Times. I'd first brought it up publicly four years ago when I wrote a letter in support of Humanist UK's faith school campaign. Anyway, it's not just humanists like me who are arguing that schools shouldn't push a particular faith on children or create segregation in this way. Plenty of religious people, including religious leaders, are also in favour of inclusive education. The Accord Coalition is chaired by an Anglican vicar, the Reverend Stephen Terry, and it's a group founded some 10 years ago to broaden the debate around faith schools and advance inclusive education. In April, the former Bishop of Bolton became the latest distinguished supporter of the Accord Coalition. And yet, and yet, we're seeing an expansion of state faith schools and no suggestion at all from the church that it intends ending any of its discriminatory admissions practices. Here are just a couple of quotes from parents in the 2015 report for the Fair Admissions Campaign. The school is dividing the community. Most middle-class white English parents play the game and send their children to the church school while everyone else attends the non-church school, depriving children at both schools of a balanced mix of friends. Here's another one. 
I can't understand how we can have three schools 0.4 miles away, but due to religious discrimination, we're unable to get into any of them. I now won't be able to return to work as I can't get my son to his school and me into work from a mother in Surrey. Now, a common defense of faith schools is that they provide, they provide a sound basis for moral education. There's still a perception floating around that morals without religion are somehow morally bankrupt. Back in 2003, the agony aunt and novelist Anne Atkins said on Radio 4's Thought for the Day, which I want to be the first humanist presenting, <laughs> Anne Atkins said, without God, where do we find absolutes of right and wrong? What is to stop a secular society sinking to depths of depravity that as yet we only dream of? <laughs> Anne Atkins' fear is misplaced, of course. Religiosity is not correlated with low rates of violence. In fact, it's the other way round. Secular countries tend to be less violent than religious ones. The main factor driving the advance of both peace and emancipated values is, as Steven Pinker so eloquently articulates, in his latest, latest book, Enlightenment Now, education. And in answer to her first question, how do we know right from wrong, a humanist would perhaps reply that ethical behavior is best guided not by recourse to religion, but by employing empathy, self-control, the moral sense, and reason, the faculties which Steven Pinker has described, borrowing a phrase from Abraham Lincoln, as the better angels of our nature. Pinker argues that the historical reduction of violence from interpersonal violence to wars between states and the rights revolutions of the 19th through to the 21st centuries have come about principally through the application of cold, hard reason to moral and ethical questions. That cold, hard reason makes us warmer and softer. It makes us better people. Anyway, back to that week in November where everybody from Julie Lynn to Peter Hitchens was queuing up to have a go at me. I canceled work that week. I avoided social media completely, and instead, I immersed myself in reading various works of humanist philosophy. Amongst them, I reread Margaret Knight's essays on morals without religion. Margaret Knight was a psychology lecturer at Aberdeen University, and these essays were originally spoken word. They were radio essays broadcast in 1955 on what was then the BBC's home service, what is now Radio 4. And there had been a huge backlash against these programmes at the time and against her as well. So I felt in that moment back in November as though I had a lot in common with Margaret Knight. But I also couldn't help to reflect, and it was very uplifting to see how much progress there had been since the 1950s. So for the middle part of my talk now, it's, it's not me at all. I want you to imagine that you're back in 1955 listening to the World Service as I read excerpts from Margaret Knight's Morals Without Religion. She started by addressing her talks to the ordinary man and woman. The general feeling is that it does not matter much what views a man holds on the higher management of the universe. I must say at this point, we can forgive her for using man for everyone. She means humans, she means men and women. As long as he has the right views on how to behave to his neighbor. They're not at all troubled about religion, this ordinary man and woman except for one thing, what shall they teach the children? For where intellectual doubts are concerned, this ordinary parent's feeling is, who am I to judge? I find these doctrines hard to believe, but many very able men believe them, men who have studied the subject much more fully than I have. Furthermore, parents are repeatedly told that Christianity is the only alternative to communism, and there can be no sound character training that is not based on religion. When juvenile delinquency increased after the war, they heard on all sides that this was the inevitable result of the decay of religious belief and the lack of sound religious training in the home. And in 1944, a new education act was passed by which daily prayers and religious instruction were made compulsory in the state schools. So on the whole, our ordinary parent thinks it is best to take no risks. When the children are older, they can decide for themselves. Meanwhile, better bring them up in the orthodox way. Talk to them about God, teach them to say their prayers, take them to church occasionally, and try to stave off awkward questions. 
I am not out to destroy, Margaret Knight said, the Christian convictions of people in whom they're deeply implanted and to whom they mean a great deal. And I'm sure that nothing I say here will have the slightest effect on believers of this type. But what I do want to argue is that in a climate of thought that is increasingly unfavorable to these beliefs, it is a mistake to try to impose them on children and to make them the basis of moral training. The moral education of children is much too important a matter to be built on such foundations. Most Christians have ceased to believe in the devil and the orthodox view is that the universe is controlled by a single all-powerful and wholly benevolent power. And that raises insuperable intellectual difficulties. For why should this all-powerful and wholly benevolent being have created so much evil? It is no answer to say that God is not responsible for the evil, that evil is due to man who has misused his free will and defied God's edicts. Because it is not true that all the evil in the universe is due to man. Man is not responsible for leprosy and gangrene and cancer to take a few obvious examples. There is no possible answer to the dilemma that so troubled St. Augustine. Either God cannot prevent evil, or he will not. If he cannot, he is not all powerful. If he will not, he is not all good. This difficulty arises for all religions which hold that there is an omnipotent and benevolent power in control of the universe. It is undeniable that in the present scientific climate of thought, Belief in these doctrines is becoming more and more difficult to maintain. Just as, to take what I should regard as a parallel case, it is almost now impossible for anyone to believe in witches, though I do not imagine any scientist has ever disproved their existence. Actually, there is not much attempt today to defend Christian dogma by reasoning. The fashionable attitude among orthodox believers is a defiant anti-intellectualism. People say, of course I realize these beliefs are, not, beliefs are not literally true, but then children are not lit literal minded. They think naturally in terms of symbol and legend. So why not make use of this tendency in character training? It is no use giving the child cold blooded lessons in ethics. Moral teaching has got to have color and warmth and interest. So why not give them that by the means which lie ready to hand, the myths of religion and the moving and beautiful ceremonies of the church? The child will cease to believe in the myths as he grows older, but that won't matter. They will have served their purpose. Well, I agree that moral training cannot be coldly rational. There must be color and warmth and interest. One of the best ways to give that is to give the child plenty of models that he can admire and imitate. Tell him plenty of stirring stories, stories that will move and excite him and make him think that that is the sort of person he would like to be. This may be far more effective even at the time, than tying up the idea of goodness with the church and religion. If a young child is brought up in the orthodox way, he, he will accept what he's told happily enough to begin with. But if he's normally intelligent, he's almost bound to get the impression there's something odd about religious statements. If he's taken to church, for example, he hears that death is the gateway to eternal life and should be welcomed rather than shunned. Yet outside, he sees death regarded as the greatest of all evils and everything possible done to postpone it. If he asks questions, he gets embarrassed, evasive answers. Well, dear, you're not old enough to understand yet, but some of these things are true in a deeper sense. And so on. The child soon gets the idea that there are two kinds of truth, the ordinary kind and another rather confusing and slightly embarrassing kind into which it is best not to inquire too closely. All this is bad intellectual training. It tends to produce a certain intellectual timidity, a distrust of reason, a feeling that perhaps it's rather bad taste to pursue an argument to its logical conclusion or to refuse to accept a belief on inadequate evidence. And that is not a desirable attitude in the citizens of a free democracy. However, it is the moral rather than the intellectual dangers that I'm concerned with here. And they arise when the trustful child becomes a critical adolescent. He may then cast off all his religious beliefs, and if his moral training has been too closely tied up with religion, it is more than possible that the moral beliefs will go too. He may well decide that it's all just old wives' tales, and now he does not know where he is. At this stage, he could be the most vulnerable to communist propaganda. Far from being a protection against communism, tying up morals with religion could help drive people into its arms. On the subject of communism, she continues, it's a mistake, I suggest, 
to think of Christianity and communism as the two great rival forces in the world today. The fundamental opposition is between dogma and the scientific outlook. On the one side, Christianity and communism, the two great rival dogmatic systems, and on the other, scientific humanism, which is opposed to both. Scientific humanism does not regard it as a virtue to believe without evidence. It deals with hypotheses, not dogma. Hypotheses that are constantly tested and revised in the light of new facts, rather than with alleged immutable truths that it is heresy to question. And it is concerned with human beings and with this life, rather than with supernatural beings and another world, because it believes that the primary good lies in human happiness and development, men and women realizing to the full their capacities for affection, for happiness, for intellectual and aesthetic experience, and regards these things as more important than any ideology or abstraction, whether it is the church or the state or the five-year plan or the life hereafter. In this first talk, she concludes, I've inevitably been rather negative, but next week I hope to be more constructive, to present scientific humanism in its positive aspect and to return to the question I raised at the beginning of this talk, namely, how should the humanist parent set about the moral education of his children? 1950s Britain was rocked by her words, but there was more to come. Morals without religion, part two. In my last talk, I suggested that orthodox Christianity is no longer intellectually tenable and that scientific humanism provides the best answer to our need for a constructive attitude to life and a code of conduct. I want here to deal with two questions that are of considerable practical importance to humanist parents, namely, what should they tell their children about God and what sort of moral training should they give them? We must, I am sure, tell children something about God. We cannot just bypass the problem by not mentioning it. And for young children, I would suggest tentatively something of this sort. We can tell them that everyone believed at one time, and some people believe now, that there are two great powers in the world, a good power called God who made the world and who loves human beings and wants them to love one another and to be happy and good, and a bad power called the devil who is opposed to God and wants people to be unhappy and bad. We can tell them that some people still believe this, but that most people now think there is not really a devil. The devil is something like the ogres and witches in the fairy tales. And we can tell them that some people now do not think there really is a God, though we often talk as though they were. Then when the child asks us what we believe, as he certainly will, we can say that we do not think there really is a God, but that many people think otherwise, and that he can make up his own mind when he's older. May I say at once that I do not think it would be desirable for children to grow up in ignorance of the New Testament. Those stories are part of the fabric of our culture, they're woven into our literature and art and architecture. The child should hear them. All I urge is that they should be treated, frankly, as legends. Let children read and listen to the New Testament stories in the same way they read and listen to the stories of Greek mythology. And when they ask if the stories are true, they can be told that they're a mixture of fact and legend. Now the question of humanist character training. To begin with, a little psychology. At different times, very different views have been held about the nature of man. At one extreme was the view held by the philosopher Hobbes that man is essentially selfish. If we help our neighbor, it is just because we think it may induce him to help us later on. At the other extreme is the view of which Rousseau was the chief exponent, that man is naturally unselfish and cooperative, and that if he behaves otherwise, it can only be because his natural development has been interfered with. Neither of these extreme views is correct. The truth lies between. To start with a good resounding platitude, human nature is very mixed. It is natural for us to be, to a large extent, self-interested and to be hostile and aggressive towards people who obstruct us in getting at what we want. And it is also natural for us to want to cooperate with other people and to feel affection and sympathy for them. In more technical terms, Margaret Knight says, we have both ego instincts and social instincts which may pull us in different ways. It is arguable that civilization depends largely on widening the scope of the social impulses. And this argument is, is revised and recounted in, in Pinker's Better Angels, uh, where he talks about widening the, the circle of sympathy to all humanity. Back to Margaret. 
Morality in the humanist view can best be regarded as an organized attempt to reinforce the social impulses. This does not mean that we must always be making sacrifices. We have a duty to ourselves as well as others. But the essence of humanist morality is disinterestedness, not letting our own claims and interests blind us to other people's. So when we come to the practical question of child upbringing, perhaps the most important question to ask is this, is it in any way possible by our methods of upbringing to increase the chance that the child will grow up to be a warm-hearted and generous person? This is a question which can receive a refreshingly definite answer, she says, and the gist of the answer can be conveyed in one word, love. Warm-hearted and generous natures are developed not primarily by training and discipline, important though these are in other ways, and she does have a bit of a diversion into spanking later on. We have moved on a bit since the 1950s. But by love. If a child is brought up in a warm, happy, confident, affectionate home atmosphere, he has the best chance of developing into a well-balanced, secure, affectionate, and generous-minded person. Parents should never say, I won't love you if you do that, or if you do that, you're not my little boy. The child should never get the impression that this parent's love is in any way conditional. This does not mean that we should never make it clear to a child that we take a poor view of something he has done, but this is the important point. Condemn the act, but not the child himself. My time is running short and the religious listener has perhaps been getting more and more restive. This is all very well, he's perhaps saying, but what is the ultimate sanction of this moral training? What answer could you make if the child were to ask, why should I consider others? Why shouldn't I be completely selfish? What possible answer is there except the religious one? Because it is God's will. Why should I consider others? These ultimate moral questions, like all ultimate questions, can be desperately difficult to answer, as every philosophy student knows. Myself, I think the only possible answer to this question is the humanist one. Because we are naturally social beings, we live in communities, and life in any community, from the family outwards, is much happier and fuller and richer if the members are friendly and cooperative than if they're hostile and resentful. But the religious listener may feel this is simply evading the point. So may I say in conclusion that the answer he would propose is not really any more satisfactory. The skeptic could always answer, why should I do God's will? Why shouldn't I please myself? And that surely is just as much of a poser as why should I consider others to start with? In fact, it's a good deal more of a poser in view of some of the things that the believer must suppose God to have willed. But we need not go into all that again. For in any case, case, this question of ultimate sanctions is largely theoretical. I have never yet met the child, and I've met very few adults, to whom it's ever occurred to raise the question, why should I consider others? Most people are prepared to accept as a completely self-evident moral axiom that we must not be completely selfish. And if we base our moral training on that, we shall, I suggest, be building on firm enough foundations. They're wonderful essays, and thank you for listening to them again. I think, they, I think they bear revisiting. Now, the reaction was enormous. <laughs> this isn't actually Margaret Knight, <laughs> I must admit. It provoked thousands of letters to Margaret herself, to the BBC and to the newspapers. Margaret Knight was hounded and vilified in the press for several weeks. It all sounds curiously familiar. So here's some context. After the Second World War, the churches saw a limited revival set against a long-term trend of decline which had started in the 19th century. And the BBC itself, I was very surprised about this, had developed an evangelical fervor, broadcasting more and more religious programs in the early 50s. The BBC saw it as its mission to maintain Christianity and to promote Christianity in Britain. Women had experienced an expansion of possible roles in society during the war, but they weren't to enjoy that emancipation for long. The 1950s, of course, was an era of austerity and a return to traditional domestic roles for women reinforced by the BBC's Women's Hour. The woman's place was in the home, cooking, cleaning, and of course, making babies. And then along came Margaret Knight. She certainly had to fight to get her talks on air, but eventually, having been pushed back three times, she found an ally in the controller of talks, Mary Somerville. When the first talk went out, on the 5th of January 1955, the response was relatively minor. There were 12 phone calls to the BBC, criticising the programme, 
and there were five in support of it. But during the week, the press got hold of the story and were having a field day. So this is without social media. It's basically driven by, by print media. A Telegraph article talked about Margaret Knight's sustained attack on religion in general and Christianity in particular. And later that week, the Sunday graphic ran with a full front page headlined, The Unholy Mrs. Knight, saying that the BBC had allowed a fanatic to rampage along the air lanes, not a metaphor we're familiar with now, beating up Christianity with a razor and a bicycle chain. When the second talk went out then, a week after the first, the critics had been primed and it provoked a much larger negative response uh, with 40 calls and only one of them uh, was positive. The story got bigger and bigger, unfolding in thousands of letters and mostly hostile articles in more than 30 newspapers. Some of the comments were openly misogynistic. The Daily Express headline was, a woman makes a remarkable attack on religion for children. The caption accompanying the photo of Margaret Knight on the front page of the Sunday graphic read, don't let this woman fool you. She looks, doesn't she? Just like a typical housewife. Cool, comfortable, harmless. But Mrs. Knight is a menace, a dangerous woman. Make no mistake about that. The Daily Express interviewed churchmen for their opinions, with the Bishop of Coventry, Neville Gorton, quoted as calling her a brusque, so competent, bossy female, but also a very simple-minded female. And this is the sort of woman who drags children from the cross. All of this under what I have to admit is a completely inspired headline. Bishop checks Mrs. Knight. <laughs> Margaret Knight's childlessness also counted against her uh, with comments like, I cannot understand why the BBC allows a woman to express her views upon child training when she, when she herself is childless. It's quite shocking today. And many commentators adopted a deeply patronizing tone. For example, feel pity for this unhappy, over-educated woman. How barren her theory, how truly ignorant she really is. Poor dear, don't be scathing in your judgment, but truly, truly sorry for her. There's more than a hint of a patronizing tone here, I think. If she really doesn't like the prayers and the Christian teaching, she can withdraw her children from them, but she doesn't. I suspect that she's also quite able to pay school fees if she chooses and to escape the whole business. So why is she making a public martyr of herself? Could it be that she's just an annoying zealot? Peter Hitchens again in November 2018. The social historian Callum Brown, who I've been corresponding with over recent weeks, has analyzed the Margaret Nice affair in depth. He wrote, to be an atheist in the 1950s was broadly acceptable if one was a man engaged in intellectual pursuit, but to be an atheist was culturally unacceptable if one was a woman who looked like an ordinary housewife, was childless, and might endanger children. So is it still culturally unacceptable to be a visible female humanist, albeit one with children? Callum Brown identifies several themes in the criticism of Margaret Knight and her radio essays. Uh, including misogyny, intellectual snobbery, where either Margaret herself was accused of being simple-minded or the people listening in were poor parents uh, who were likely to be led astray by simplistic e atheistic arguments. Uh, another, uh, another criticism was removal of comfort. One commentator described Knight's cruel broadcasts, cruel because they hit at the only comfort and hope of countless people. And of course, there was that opening the door uh, to communism as well. Canon Percival Sexty from Wiltshire wrote, Mrs. Knight's lectures have been the greatest gift communism has ever had in this country, and our American friends will think we've taken leave of our senses. In 2018, interestingly, the spectre of communism was replaced by that of Islam. Peter Hitchens in the Mail on Sunday again back in November. 
I wonder, does Alice think that the triumph of humanism and the expulsion of Christianity from the schools will lead to some sort of secular paradise? She's in for a shock. Religion in this country is due for a revival as material wealth fails. I'm not sure where he's getting that from. But who will benefit? The force that is most likely to fill the gap when the church dies is Islam, strong, increasingly powerful, and present in our midst, confident, quite unafraid of people like her. If she gets her way, she may live to see her granddaughters attending schools where they have to wear hijabs and chant the Quran. Then, rather too late, she might see, start to see the virtues of the Church of England. It's the same argument. Christianity was our defense against communism in the 1950s. Now, apparently, it's our defense against fundamentalist Islam. Another criticism of Margaret Knight was that she was unpatriotic and anti-Christian in a Christian country with Christian values, and that the BBC had essentially collaborated with her. The Daily Telegraph accused the BBC of a sponsoring of atheism, fearing a precedent being set for broadcasting, in quotes, agnostic propaganda, equivalent to, again, in quotes, a serious apologia for homosexuality or any other manifestation of the frailties of human nature. Peter Hitchens also alludes to the role of the BBC in helping spread my dangerous ideas. Professor Roberts, Lisa gives me a title there, uh, who is on TV a lot, has just become the new face of Humanist UK, a movement dedicated, as far as I can make out, to spreading the belief that there is no God. <laughs> Note that the professor's increasingly public commitment to being anti-religious has not prevented her from presenting several prominent programmes on the supposedly impartial BBC. These days, it hardly seems worth even questioning that. Back to Margaret Knight. Uh, we've, we've heard a lot of criticisms from the right-wing press, but actually... Uh, most liberal and left-wing newspapers supported her right to express her views publicly, even if they disagreed with them. As for the letters, the BBC received nearly 1,600 letters uh, after those, those two essays went out. And the split was around 60% against, but 40% for. And Margaret Knight herself received more than 1,100, and there was a similar split there. And the Daily Express reported receiving around a thousand letters, again with a similar split, for and against. And the positive responders were saying things like, at last someone is saying these things we felt for so long. When Margaret Knight published her radio essays, she included quotes from, from several letters, including this one from Germany. Please accept my gratitude from an unknown man who's seen in your talk the sun rising of a new epoch based on simple reflection, to do the good because it is good, and not because you expect to be uh, re recompensed after your death. Being myself a victim of Nazi oppression, I think we all have to teach our children the supreme ethics based on facts and not on legends in the deepest interest for future generations. And I received plenty of positive responses too, uh, some in print and, and some from religious leaders. So GP Taylor, a priest, wrote in the Yorkshire Post, this is something that even I as a priest fully agree with. I've never been able to understand why taxpayers' money should go towards funding schools with an ethos based on a particular faith. Surely, if a religion wants to subliminally proselytize children, it should pay for it itself. Better still, it should not be allowed to do it at all. And he went on, we can be thankful to the church for all they've done in the past in bringing education to the masses, but times change and the glory days of the church benignly helping society educate its children is over. Britain is no longer a Christian country, and there are other faiths wanting to open schools. I think it's now right for all religions to get their hands off education. There is a growing need to limit the influence of religious groups in places where our children are being educated. I'm not sure whether a priest would have spoken out so openly in the 1950s. Times have changed. A report commissioned by the BBC in 1954 showed Britain to be a fairly religious country. 25% of the population were frequent churchgoers, 39% were non-churchgoers, but only 3% responded that they didn't believe in Christianity anymore. Our country is now largely non-religious. In the last British Social Attitudes Survey, less than half of the UK population said they were religious. And this will continue to fall. 
If we look at a more recent survey of young people under the age of 30, 70% said they were not religious. And of those that were, 10% were Catholic, 7% Anglican, and 6% Muslim. Fewer than a million people, well under a million people, attend church regularly. And Jeremy Paxman aler alerted me to this comparison. Uh, the RSPB uh, has more than a million members. So if we have Anglican bishops in the House of Lords, um, I don't know, perhaps Miranda Krestovnikov, who's currently president of, of RSPB, should be in the House of Lords as well. <laughs> And yet, of course, despite this, we, we still have an established church, those bishops and the state-funded faith schools. The moral panic and media circus around Margaret Knight's radio essays was intense, but it was short-lived. It died away after about three weeks. But it was seen as a historical watershed. Callum Brown identifies the Knight Affair of 1955 as an important cultural turning point. He rates it as about equivalent in its impact to the trial of Lady Chatterley's lover, in 1960. Whether the Margaret Knight affair accelerated the cultural change or just reflected it, it was this watershed moment. The writer Ludovic Kennedy commentated, uh, before Mrs. Knight, Britain had been a more or less Christian country. After her, it became a more or less secular one. For the BBC, the balance of criticism was important. 60% had been negative, certainly, but 40% positive. And that assured some of the managers there that their audience was ready for more liberal debate and that free speech, even if it was seen as anti-religious, was an important principle to defend. Outside the BBC, humanist groups grew in numbers and campaigned for more humanist voices to be heard on air. But in the end, it was audiences who voted with their feet or their ears and eyes. Listening and viewing figures for religious programmes were dwindling as we moved into the 1960s and 70s, while the tone of programming was becoming more liberal and less deferential. Monty Python was regularly to be found mocking organised religion, and atheists such as uh, Jacob Bronowski were set loose with landmark series on the BBC. Margaret Knight herself appeared a few more times in televised debates and on Women's Hour. In the end, the response to Knight exposed highly gendered attitudes in 1950s Britain. There was that readiness of her critics to savage her as a childless woman. And the other really prominent theme in those responses is the fear of atheism as a very dangerous idea. But the public response to the affair also exposed a nation divided. And Margaret Knight had taken this philosophical debate into the public arena. She was criticized for that. She was criticized for not knowing enough theology, for not using enough technical language. But in fact, her argument was not dumbed down. It was devastatingly simple. Her really dangerous idea then was not that morals could be taught without religion, was not even that God did not, in her opinion, exist. It was that these things could be open for everyone to debate. She reduced the argument down to basic principles and made it understandable and accessible. Her most dangerous idea then, I think, was that ordinary people could dare to think for themselves. Thank you.